The S&P 500 has just opened and is pretty mixed right across the board, although you wouldn't be happy as a Tesla investor down 6%. They did just recently miss on some data that came out this morning, as well as Nike investors not too happy with the latest earnings from yesterday after market close. But there is one investor who is much worse off than both of these combined, and that is a Humana Inc. investor. This is just down this morning around 17%. Over the last 12 months, down 53%. And as we can see, this is now trading pretty much towards a new 52-week low. So what's going on with this company? Is it one we should consider buying after a massive drop? Is it a market overreaction or should we steer clear? Now, first thing we want to understand is what is the reason, the justification for this drop? And as the headline shows here, data shows membership in the high-rating Medicare plan declines. Now, not too great, let's be honest, where the membership is falling, and as we will come to see, by quite a significant percentage as well. And for those that are fairly new to this company, well, effectively, they are a major seller of government-backed plans, which is designed for adults aged over 65. Now, what's very interesting to note, only 25% of the members had signed up for plans, and this is down significantly from 94% in the previous year. As we will come on to see, that is a lot worse than what even the bearish investors had anticipated. A few other points that have really hurt this company as well. We can in fact see, although this was noted in July, hence why this company has been setting off pretty much the most of 2024, was that medical care as a whole, the demand has been a lot higher than what has been projected. And this has really scared investors. They do believe that this will ultimately lead into these health insurers not being able to manage this in terms of the expectations in terms of the profitability and ultimately in terms of shareholder returns and what we have seen here is effectively the post pandemic where a lot of people were waiting for any of their health procedures to take place and now a lot of demand is coming up a lot of people want to go through any of the health procedures that they now need that they had been putting off during that pandemic and on top of that we also note here that payments from the government as well has been a lot less than what this company had been anticipating what's not great to note as well is that a massive earnings hit is potentially estimated where they see around nine dollars a share in 2026 and that is quite large when we do come to look at their earnings per share that is effectively more than 50 percent of the eps anticipated in 2024 for the full year and just under half for the full year of 2025 now, as we can see, they have been suffering, in fact, year to date as well, as we mentioned, a downward trend, bad news after bad news. Over the last 10 years as well, they are up around 84%. So if you have been a long-term shareholder, you would have effectively underperformed the S&P. If you want to see all-time highs, you need to go back to October 2022, where this company was trading $552.00. Right now, it is trading less than half of that value. We do, however, note there is still a double buy rating from Seeking Alpha and Wall Street, and we do get that hold rating from Quan. Now, when we take a look at some of the underlying metrics of Humana, we do get a 99 very safe dividend score, in fact, the highest score obtainable. The yield, as we will come on to show you, is the highest it has been over the last five years, at 1.61%. We get the undervaluation signal from this new model, which we will touch upon, and we are still waiting on a dividend increase in 2024. In terms of dividend safety, this was reaffirmed in the middle of August, so we will come to see if this has changed, but so far, based on the data, there is no issues with the overall safety, and this ultimately means a dividend cut is highly unlikely. Key metrics from the Great Recession 0709, no dividend was paid, so no comparative data. They had plus 6% recession sales, a lot better than the average of the S&P, which was negative 12. But ultimately, in terms of return, they did trail the S&P negative 72, as we can see here, S&P itself negative 55. Last five years, as well as the last 10 years, has been very strong for the dividend, ultimately double digits, which is something we love to see as dividend growth investors. And they have ultimately been increasing those dividends for the last 12 years. Now, when we do take a look at this valuation model, we do get an undervaluation signal. When we zoom in over the last year, we do note for the majority, it has been trading below the blue bucket, which is essentially the fair value. So this does give us that undervaluation signal. But as always, we do run this through our own model ourselves. 
We also note on dividend yield theory, we have a significant undervaluation signal, the yield of 1.54 above the five year rolling, as well as the forward P 13.4 sitting below the five year average of 19.2. It does also look lower significantly, in fact, than the healthcare as a sector at 16.7. So we pretty much get four undervaluation signals for this company, but as always, we don't look at these models in isolation. We will conclude towards the end. We then focus on the free cash flow. Remember, earnings susceptible to manipulation by management through accounting. Below 60% is what we want. That is what we see quite significantly. 15% in 23, 22 over the next 12 months. So realistically, we should expect them to continue with the nice increases moving forwards, although we are still waiting for that increase this year. We then move on to the free cash flow per share, where we want consistent increases over the long term. Now look, they've tripled it from 2014 to 2023, but very inconsistent on a year-on-year -year basis. And we do have to point out expectations over the next 12 months are a decrease to around $16.20. Not something we ultimately seen, given the fact we want moving forwards an upwards trajectory. Then in terms of sales growth, well, 3 to 7% didn't very strongly over the last 10 years, nearly double digit for the majority of the period. Last three years looking very good and accelerating. 13% on a trailing 12 month basis is always a very good sign to note. But do remember the expectation is there could be a hit to the earnings per share over the next few years. Total sales numerically pretty much more than doubled, and they've also returned some excess cash to shareholders through those buybacks on a year-on-year -year basis, although very inconsistent and very trivial. But again, it is a bit of a bonus and always nice to see on top of those double-digit dividend increases. ROIC, 10% or more, one of our favorite metrics right here on this channel, gives us faith management are able to effectively allocate their capital above 10% every year, 16% over the last two years, so looking promising, as well as the 13% on a trailing 12 month basis. And while for the operating margin, we wanna see not just above the 12%, but also increasing to show us efficiencies. We do know with this industry, the majority of companies have fairly low margins. So this is no surprise, nothing that we would say as a negative, but ideally we would wanna see it move towards the 12% over the longer term. Free cash flow margin as well, we can see it pretty much straddling around the 5% level that we want to see on a year-on-year -year basis. 3% in the more recent year, again, ideally moving towards that 5% point. One thing that we do love about this company that isn't talked about a lot, the net debt to EBITDA, earnings before the interest, tax, appreciation, and amortization, is zero right across the board. We want to see below three, and the reason for this, this essentially correlates to dividend safety, balance sheet strength, and zero right across the board refers to the number of years it would take the company to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand. It wouldn't even take this company one day. So very, very strong, very good balance sheet and something we will take a closer look at. Now, we also want to let you know we have released our latest free weekly article. Every Monday, we do send one out where we cover what's happened in the market over the last few days. We talk about some stocks that we are looking to buy in the more recent one for October. So do go ahead, check that out. And you can read and sign up and look at these straight away instant access. And also, in fact, just recently, we have released our 36 undervalued stocks for the month of October, where we have a lot of information for each one. Talk about those that sit within our own portfolio as well. And you can also grab 22 of the most upside stocks right now in the market. So go ahead, sign up and grab these straight away. Now, we also like to look at these companies in terms of what institutions and insiders are doing. Now, Insider essentially 0.32% ownership. There's been no selling over the last year. There's been one buy, but what we can note, you have to go back now all the way to quarter one for the 200,000 buy. So we would say it is outdated, whilst typically we consider it a bullish signal, given the fact that in the more recent quarter, we see nothing. It isn't one that we would really use in our own investment analysis, but we can show you in fact here, the direct in fact on the 20th of February did buy 545 shares for a price of around $367. Right now it is trading significantly lower. We have the same look at institutions, pretty high 92.4%, around 8.5 billion worth of sales over the last year. And we pretty much get roughly the same amount of buys during the same period. So you could argue institutions are pretty much indifferent right now about this company. Although if you do look at the more recent quarter, there is nearly double the amount of buyers than there is sales. Regardless, always do your own due diligence, never copy what insiders or the institutions do. Now we've already covered their top line revenue. We also wanna see what kind of story does the bottom line show us. But as we mentioned, pretty much doubled from the 2014 position to 2023. As we can see, going from around 49 billion in 2014, 
to 106 in the more recent annual report. Now, what does the bottom line show us in terms of growth? Well, looking firstly from a graphical perspective, we do get a lot of inconsistency on a year on year basis. In fact, from 2020, it just has started to come down, which is a little bit of a red flag indicator because what we saw above was revenue increase over the last four years. To get the opposite trend is a little bit concerning for the same period, but we do note overall going from 1.1 billion in 2014 to 2.5 in 2023. So something just to consider and maybe to think about when we do come to the margin of safety. Now balance sheet, quick health check, total cash versus total debt. They had around 1.9 billion of cash in 2014. They now hold around 5.5 billion. And as we can see over the longer term, their cash position has started to build up. Remember in isolation, that number will not tell us anything. So let's compare it to their total debt numerically and directionally which has also increased, in fact, threefold from 4.2 billion in 2014 to 13.3 in the latest report. So just something to bear in mind, total debt has also been increasing similar to their cash. What we did, however, note earlier was in fact, net debt to EBITDA has been zero right across the board. So that is fairly decent for now, but a few things we have covered today that you should consider. Now, over the next four quarters, very inconsistent. In fact, Q3, so the next quarter they're reporting, they are anticipating 55% decrease to the EPS on a year-on-year -year basis. In fact, quarter four, they are anticipating negative EPS, and it's only starting to become positive in quarter one, 2025. We also note when looking over the last four quarters, they've got a 75% track record. They have beaten three of the last four, notably the more recent one by quite a substantial beat of 1.1. Now, if they do hit that December 2025 EPS estimate of 20, the forward P will come down to around 14. But as we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, they did mention a potential $9 hit to the earnings per share. Now, let's have a very quick look at some gradings. First one, valuation. What we do notice here, they get a C grade. As we can see, the P is actually lower. This hasn't updated yet. So it is around 14 and it is much lower than the sector median of 22, which we did take a look at earlier on. What this ultimately is telling us, Humana Inc. right now trading at a discount to the overall sector and pretty much what we see right across every single valuation metric. Now, does it deserve to have this much of a discount? Should it in fact trade at a premium? These are questions we do answer as we go through, but ultimately we need to understand on a valuation perspective, are we happy buying it right now after the drop? Now, in terms of looking at the growth, we get an F grading here. Year on year, well, 13.5%. Sector median, 7%, so a lot better. Forward looking, around 8%, a little bit lower than the sector of 8.42. And I think what really gives it that poor rating above is the earnings per share of 4.84% expected increase over the next three to five years, which is significantly lower than the 11.2% of the sector as a whole. We also get the profitability where they get a C+. Now, gross profit margin, 15.5%. That is significantly lower than the sector median of 58. We also note the net income margin, very, very low at 1.53. Whilst it is better than the sector of negative five, that is still a very low margin and we do want to see much higher. So something just to consider. The other thing that we do want to point out that isn't that great on a trading 12-month basis is the cash from operations has been negative 4.3 billion. Even though the sector is negative, it is to a much smaller degree at negative 14. Now, quick conclusion for this part of the analysis, a double buy rating from Seeking Alpha and Wall Street, a hold from Quant, C on the valuation, F on the growth, with a C plus on profitability. Now, before we do jump into the valuation model itself, let's compare how they performed against others in the industry. As you can see here, some very big names, which we have covered before on this channel. We want to understand, is this issue isolated to Humana or is this an issue with the industry overall? Now, over the last 12 months, we know Humana down 51%, making it one of the worst performing, but only two, in fact, out of these six have actually been negative. But we do also know pretty much other than AL's HC, the rest have had some very, very poor performances. Over the last five years, we can see again, Humana, one of the worst performing down 4%. Over the last 10 years, we can see, and this is, remember, reinvesting those dividends. It is up 100%, but that isn't really great over the last 10 years. Something just to bear in mind, some others have performed much stronger. In fact, we also have others that have performed much worse. Remember, though, the past performance is not an indicator of the future. 
Now our intrinsic value of $269, we're gonna run through how we get to this now. And as always, if you do enjoy the content, value is being provided, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button, so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. So let's jump into the first model. We have the multiples valuation, companies in the similar sector and size, their PE, the average, multiplied by the EPS of Humana, and we can see here our first overvaluation signal. Remember, we're not looking at any of these models in isolation. We then have the yearly dividends, very strong growth, around 12.1% over the last few years. Now we have gone a lot more conservative, around 6.5%. It is fairly subjective, so remember you can grab a copy of this model by clicking on the pinned comment below, running your own numbers, whether it's for Humana or any others. And we get here our first undervaluation signal. We then move on to the DCF model with the free cash flow year on year. We have the average growth rate at 78%. We've been very consistent. We've gone pretty much flat. And we know with the discount rate, we get the present value of future free cash flows and terminal value. We add together with the cash, subtract total debt, get to the equity value, divide by shares outstanding. And as we can see here, a second undervaluation signal. Now the intrinsic value in today's episode is the average of these three models coming to $268. And as always, we do like to imply a margin of safety. Now we start off with 10% and execute on that if it meets our three golden criteria wide moat, strong financial metrics, good forward-looking data. If you believe that in today's episode, a buy up to $241, then we keep going till it's near the current trading price. Now, it's not a 20% MOS just yet, but not too far off. So sitting somewhere between 15 to 20% in today's episode, and we have Wall Street's revised price target of $260. Now, they do see 18% upside, and as we said, 15% MOS, but given the issues surrounding this company, in my personal opinion, there are a lot better options. For example, you have UNH, you have ELV, that I do believe are better alternatives to this company. Whether or not though, maybe this is one you will consider if it does come down a little bit more, then that is something to consider. For example, 20%, as we said, $215, 25% around $201, and at the 30% level, $188. However, in today's episode, sitting somewhere between the 15 to 20% with 18% upside, according to Wall Street. As always, though, do give us your thoughts in the comments below. Is this one you are now starting to consider? Maybe you've got a position and you're looking to hold, or maybe you are actually looking to sell, put the money in other companies. As always, if you enjoy the episode, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button. Don't forget to sign up to the free weekly newsletter. And also, don't forget to come join us on Patreon, where we do talk about our weekly buys and sells. As always, have a great day, and we'll see you all on the next one.